Good evening, New Zealand. Leading your news hour, a claim of conspiracy to bring down America's president. It comes from the First Lady defending her husband against sex allegations over Monica Lewinsky. A top-level move to replace the Treaty of Waitangi with New Zealand's own written constitution. And first day at school, it's four times the excitement for Auckland's Griffin Quads. <laughs> Bill and I have been accused of everything, including murder, by some of the very same people who are behind these allegations. The president's wife and chief defender lashes out at her husband's accusers. Hillary Clinton blames a right-wing conspiracy for using his alleged affair with the White House intern to try to force him from office. Her TV appearance came as the president prepared to deliver a speech on the state of the nation. More on that in a moment, but it's this state of the president that's under the most scrutiny. Michael Holland reports. Hillary Clinton arrived for her breakfast television interview looking poised and ready to do battle. From my perspective, this is part of the continuing political campaign against my husband. Mrs Clinton blames a right-wing conspiracy fronted by independent prosecutor Kenneth Starr, who's investigating the sex allegations. We get a politically motivated prosecutor who is allied with the right-wing opponents of my husband scratching for dirt, intimidating witnesses, doing everything possible to try to make some accusation against my husband. Starr quickly fired back. That is nonsense, he said in a written statement. We received credible evidence of serious federal crimes. Starr is investigating allegations that Bill Clinton had an affair with Monica Lewinsky and then pressured her to lie about it in court. While the president denies any sexual relationship, today more pictures of them in another encounter. This one a month after she was moved off the White House staff. Today, a grand jury probe into the allegations opened with evidence from this woman, the president's personal secretary. We have nothing to say. It was Betty Curry who repeatedly cleared Lewinsky into the White House and signed for packages she sent to the Oval Office. Curry also asked the president's close friend, Vernon Jordan, to find Lewinsky a job. But most eyes today were on the First Lady as she stood by her man. You know, we've been married for 22 years, Matt, and I have learned a long time ago that the only people who count in any marriage are the two that are in it. We know everything there is to know about each other. But what if, she was asked, the president had committed adultery and then lied to cover it up? Should the American people ask for his resignation? If all that were proven true, I think that would be a very serious offense. That is not going to be proven true. Not going to be proven true, maybe. But there was no denial of the alleged affair either. Michael Holland, One Network News. Mrs Clinton refused to be drawn further on specific allegations, saying all things needed to be put in context. Within hours, President Clinton also appeared on national television as he delivered the annual State of the Nation speech. His aim to swing the spotlight from sex to government policy. His 75-minute sp uh, speech made no mention of his personal problems. Instead, he focused on his achievements in office, winning standing ovations as he pointed to the reduced budget deficit and the booming economy. He also outlined initiatives which range from space research to social security and childcare issues. As well as addressing domestic issues, Mr Clinton has an unmistakable warning for Iraq who share our goal. You have used weapons of mass destruction before. We are determined to deny you the capacity to use them again. Backing up those words, American officials are seeking Allied support for a possible military strike against Iraq. ABC's John McWethy reports on the new sense of urgency. The intensified diplomacy is being accompanied by new warnings to Iraq that time is running out. It's very clear that the train is leaving the station here. The chief UN weapons inspector today said Iraq's leaders would have to be blind and mute not to comprehend the threat they face. As for the threat they pose... We do continue to have evidence that leads us to suspect that Iraq maintains the capability to make biological weapons agent. For policymakers, that has terrifying implications. Every week that passes, Saddam Hussein 
adds enough anthrax to his stocks in order to fill two warheads on missiles. Because 25,000 U.S. troops could be within range, the Pentagon is rushing to the Gulf new detectors for such weapons, plus more protective gear and gas masks preparing for the worst. The prospect of further military action against Iraq comes ironically as President Clinton is nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He's been nominated by three MPs in Norway. In news back home tonight, there's a top-level push to give New Zealand its first written constitution. It's the idea of former Prime Minister Mike Moore. He says most countries have constitutions and the debate over one here must get underway. But already Māori are warning about the role the Treaty of Waitangi must play. Here's political reporter Duncan Garner. New Zealand's national song, one way we identify as Kiwis. Our founding document is the Treaty of Waitangi and we're one of the few countries not to have a written constitution. America's, for example, sets down basic rights which can't be overridden. Mike Moore says New Zealanders need to think about that. And it is time for this country to accept its grievances and its history and then to move on. He's prepared a private member's bill and he's now lobbying for support. His bill is unusual. What it does is set down a process for consultation, establishing a council of political leaders and a group of eminent New Zealanders. And the point of it all, to find out what Kiwis think. He's asking a number of significant questions about a constitution. What about the Treaty of Waitangi? Should New Zealand become a republic? Do we need to change the way we appoint the head of state? And should we no longer recognise the Privy Council? And finally, is MMP the right political system for the new millennium? Former Prime Ministers like the idea. This is really about New Zealand being New Zealand and not trying to be an attachment of somebody else. And, and the time has come for that to be true. We are unusual in not having a written constitution, in not having a form of superior law. Uh, and I think the time has come to consider that very seriously in New Zealand. Mike Moore says the treaty must be central to the constitution, but Māori, even in Mr Moore's own party, say it must be more than that. I don't believe that you can form a constitution in this country that doesn't have the treaty as the basis. And it isn't strong enough. It must be the real basis. And it is the founding document. Mike Moore is recommending his idea be decided by referendum. Duncan Garner, One Network News. And while some politicians are non-committal about Mike Moore's idea, others are prepared to give it a chance. The Coalition looks at all private members' bills and will weigh up whether or not we will support that. And we've got a lot more detail and talking before we would come to a conclusion. Well, I've had a chat with Mike Moore about this and uh, outlined to him my concerns about the viability of such a uh, piece of legislation. But uh, I think uh, having members of parliament putting some uh, brain power into these issues is important and I congratulate him for it. I'll be voting for it to be introduced and go to a select committee because I think Mike's raising issues about a process which parliament needs to give a lot of thought to. He's moving in the right direction. The issues are important ones for New Zealand's future. We risk peril if we ignore them. We cannot afford to do that. Oh, we're going to listen to what Mr Moore has to say. And our general principle is to encourage members of parliament to come up with proposals. And as such, just because it's from the Labour Party, we won't say no. His bill uh, brings together a number of major constitutional issues, but quite seriously, a private member's bill, an omnibus bill, that throws them all into one one take mixer, if you like, and thinks that something constructive is going to come out the other end, I think is pretty unrealistic. Political editor Linda Clark is in our Wellington studio now. Well, Linda, why is Mike Moore the one champion, so championing such sweeping debate, and, and why now? Well, Mr Moore is uh, one of Parliament's most senior members and he likes to think of himself as one of those MPs who thinks about the big picture. He has been frustrated for a long time now about uh, the way the Treaty of Waitangi has been debated and its role in New Zealand society. He's uh, frustrated that that debate has often been overtaken by extremists as he sees it and he wants some hardcore, more sensible debate as New Zealand goes into the new millennium. Interesting too about the timing because of course next week Australia sits down to its first constitution conference. They're of course discussing whether or not that country will become a republic. 
It's a long road, isn't it, from private members' bill to seeing laws passed. Is Mr Moore's grand plan likely to succeed? Well, these kind of uh, large debates about things like the Constitution are not things which Parliament finds uh, easy to deal with. Parliamentarians tend to come into the House with a three-year agenda. Some of them, of course, only last three years. They don't have that long-term horizon. Mr Moore is asking them to look into the long term. And because, as I said earlier, of uh, because of, of who he is, he is a former Prime Minister, let's not forget that he does have a lot of gravitas around Parliament, uh, it is likely to be considered more seriously than if it had come from another MP. But as Duncan Garner made the point in that, track it is going to be a long time in the coming political editor linda clark live from wellington thousands of kiwi kids had a nerve-wracking first day at school today and more than 10,000 sometimes emotional new entrants said goodbye to parents and hello to teachers and new friends well bad enough to farewell one child but spare a thought for auckland's griffin family today mum and dad said goodbye to four young ladies These girls have gone through so much, they've been really sick, and we didn't think they'd make it quite a few times. I mean, we've had meningitis, and, and just seeing them in the incubators, it's hard to think that these little things are, you know, really big and they're off the skull. Groceries are just unbelievable. About 250 a week, and they're not teenagers yet. Okay. How do you want your hair? A bit up and a bit down. Now you, you are not cutting your hair at school, are you, Lisa? Who are you? Yeah. Crystal. Okay, Crystal. No. Another cuddle? Please. In you get. Challenging. I think they're like all the other children, they'll be individuals and it'll be a joy to have them like all the other five girls starting today. I'm being strong and I, I said there's going to be a few more tears yet, but I'm getting there. And later in the news hour we find out why our primary school roles have hit their highest level in more than two decades. Coming up on One Network News, police dredge a pond for missing friends Olivia Hope and Ben Smart. Kiwi Warfares are offered big money to get involved in Australia's waterfront problems. The Chinese New Year opens here with a warning about endangered tiger economies. And Fergie shows a dab hand with a frying pan to launch a Dining with the Duchess cookbook.